Hi, welcome back to Storytime. So we are continuing with Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. And while this is considered, or, you know, they have said that it is for ages 10 and up, uh, last story time we had a bit of an unpleasant surprise with the end of the second of the last chapter. I don't know if there are going to be any more of such surprises, but we will see. Um, and if I notice that it's going south again, you know, I'll do like I did the other time and just sort of um, give you the idea of what's going on as opposed to making people uncomfortable. Because that is not what I want to do with story time. I want to bring you a story. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 21, in which the master of the Tancadere runs great risk of losing a reward of 200 pounds. This voyage of 800 miles was a perilous venture on a craft of 20 tons and at that season of the year. The Chinese seas are usually boisterous, subject to terrible gales of wind, and especially during the equinoxes, and it was now early November. It would clearly have been to the master's advantage to carry his passengers to Yokohama, since he was a, a paid a certain sum per day, but he would have been rash to attempt such a voyage, and it was imprudent even to attempt to reach Shanghai. But John Bunsby believed in the Tancadere, which rode on the waves like a seagull, and perhaps he was not wrong. Late in the day, they passed through the capricious channels of Hong Kong, and the Tancadere, impelled by favorable winds, conducted herself admirably. I do not need, pilot, said Phileas Fogg when they got into the open seas, to advise you to use all possible speed. Trust me, Your Honor, we are carrying all the sail the winds will let us. The poles would add nothing and are only used when they are going into port. It's your trade, not mine, pilot, and I'll, I confide in you. Phileas Fogg, with body erect and legs wide apart, standing like a sailor, gazed without staggering at the swelling waters. The young woman, who was seated aft, was profoundly affected as she looked out upon the ocean, darkening now with the twilight on which she had ventured in so frail a vessel. Above her head rustled the white sails, which seemed like great white wings. The boat carried forward by the wind seemed to be flying in the air. Night came. The moon was entering her first quarter, and her insufficient light would, uh, would soon die out in the midst of the horizon. Clouds were rising from the east and already overcast a part of the heavens. The pilot had hung out his light, which was very necessary in these seas crowded with vessels bound la uh, landward, for collisions are not uncommon occurrences, and at the speed she was going, the least shock would shatter the gallant little craft. Fix seated in the bow, uh, bow gave himself up to a meditation. He kept apart from his fellow travelers, knowing Mr. Fogg's taciturn tastes. Besides, he did not quite like to talk to the man whose favors he had accepted. He was thinking, too, of the future. It seemed certain that Fogg would not stop at Yokohama, but would at once take the boat for San Francisco, and the vast extent of America would, insu uh, would ensure him impunity and safety. Pog's, oh, sorry, Fogg's plan appeared to him in the simplest in the world. Instead of sailing directly from England to the United States like a common villain, he had traversed three quarters of the globe so as to gain the American continent more surely, and there, after throwing the police off his track, he would quietly enjoy himself with the fortune stolen from the bank. But once in the United States, what should he fix do? Should he abandon this man? No, a hundred times no. Until he had secured his extradition, he would not lose sight of him for an hour. It was his duty, and he would fulfill it to the end. At all events, there was one thing to be thankful for. Passepartout was not with his master, and it was above all important, and it was above all important, after the confidences Fix had imparted to him, that the servant should never have speech with his master. Phileas Fogg was also thinking of Passepartout, who had so strangely disappeared. 
Looking at the matter from every point of view, it did not seem to him impossible that, by some mistake, the men might have embarked on the Carnatic at the last moment, and this was also Aouda's opinion, who regretted very much the loss of the worthy fellow to whom she owed so much. They might then find him at Yokohama, for if the Carnatic was carrying him thinner, it would be easier. Uh, it would be easy to ascertain if he had been on board. Oh, thither, not thinner. A brisk breeze rose about ten o'clock, but though it might have been prudent to take in a reef, the pilot, after carefully examining the heavens, let the craft remain rigid as before. The Tankadere bore sail admirably as she drew a great deal of water, and everything was prepared for high speed in, cause of a uh, in case of a gale. Mr. Fogg and Aouda descended into the cabin at midnight, having been already preceded by Fix, who had lain down on one of the cots. The pilot and crew remained on deck all night. At sunrise the next day, which was November 8th, the boat had been more than 100 miles. The log indicated a mean speed of uh, between 8 and 9 miles. The Tankadere still carried all sail and was accomplishing her greatest capacity of speed. If the wind held as it was, the chances would be in her favor. During the day she kept along the coast where the currents were favorable. The coast, ir um, irregular in profile and visible sometimes across the clearings, was at most five miles distant. The sea was less boisterous since the wind came off the land, a fortunate circumstance for the boat which would suffer owing to its small tonnage by the heavy surge on the seas. The breeze subsided a little towards noon and set in from the southwest. The pilot put up his poles, but took them down again after two hours as the wind freshened up anew. Mr. Fogg and Aouda, happily unaffected by the roughness of the sea, ate with a good appetite. Fix being invited to share their repast, which he accepted with secret chagrin, to travel at this man's expense and live upon his provisions was not palatable to him. Still, he was obliged to eat, and so he ate. When the meal was over, he took Mr. Fogg apart and said, Sir, this sir scorched his lips, and he had to control himself to avoid collaring this gentleman. Sir, you have been very kind to give me a passage on this boat, but though my means will not admit of my ex uh, expending them as freely as you, I must ask to pay my share. Let us not speak of that, replied Mr. Fogg. But if I insist, no, sir, repeated Mr. Fogg in a tone which did not admit of a reply. This enters into my general expenses. Fix, as he bowed, had a stifled feeling, and going forward where he ensconced himself, did not open his mouth for the rest of the day. Meanwhile, they were progressing famously, and John Bunsby was in high hopes. He several times assured Mr. Fogg that they would reach Shanghai in time, to which that gentleman responded that he counted upon it. The crew set to work in good earnest, inspired by the reward to be gained. There was not a sheet which was not tightened, not a sail which was not vigorously hoisted, not a lurch could be charged to the man of the helm. They worked as desperately as if they were contesting in a royal yacht regatta. By evening, the log showed that 220 miles had been accomplished from Hong Kong and Mr. Fogg, sorry, hang on a second. There we go and Mr. Fogg might hope that he would be able to reach Yokohama without recording any delay in his journal, in which case the only misadventure which had overtaken him since he left London would not seriously affect his journey. The Tonkadere entered the Straits of uh, Fokien, which, separated, uh, which separate the island of Formosa from the Chinese coast in the small hours of the night and across the, uh, and across the tropic of cancer. The sea was very rough in the straits, full of eddies formed by the countercurrents, and the chopping waves broke her course, whilst it became very difficult to stand on deck. At daybreak, the wind began to blow hard again, and the heavens seemed to predict a gale. 
The barometer announced a speedy change, the mercury rising and falling capriciously. The, sun, uh, the sea also, in the southeast, raised long surges, which indicated a tempest. The sun had set the evening before in a red mist in the midst of the phosphorescent scintillations of the ocean. John Bunsby long examined the threatening aspect of the heavens, muttering indignantly between his teeth, though indistinctly. At last, he said in a low voice to Mr. Fogg, Shall I speak out to your honor? Of course. Well, we are going to have a squall. Is the wind north or south? Asked Mr. Fogg quietly. South. Look, a typhoon is coming. Glad it's a typhoon from the south, for it will carry us forward. Oh, if you take it that way, said John Bunsby, I have nothing more to say. John Bunsby's suspicions were confirmed. At a less advanced season of the year, the typhoon, according to a famous meteorologist, would have passed away like a luminous cascade of electric flame. But in the winter equinox, it was to be feared that it would burst upon them with great violence. Oh, hi, John. Hi, Garel. Good to see you both. The pilot took his precautions in advance. He reefed all the sail. The pole masts were dispensed with. All hands went forward to the bows. A single triangular, uh, triangular sail of strong canvas was hoisted to a strong jib, so as to hold the wind from behind. Then they waited. <laughs> Good to hear it. John Bunsby had requested his passengers to go below, but this imprisonment in so narrow a space with little air and the boat bouncing in the gale was far from pleasant. Neither Mr. Fogg, Fix, nor Aouda consented to leave the deck. The storm of rain and wind descended upon them towards eight o'clock, but with its bit of sail the Tancadere was lifted like a feather by a wind, an idea of whose violence can scarcely be given. To compare her speed to four times that of a locomotive going on full steam would be below the truth. The boat scudded this, uh, thus northward during the whole day, borne on by monstrous waves, preserving always, fortunately, a speed equal to theirs. Twenty times she seemed almost to be submerged by these mountains of water which rose behind her, but the adroit management of the pilot saved her. The passengers were often bathed in spray, but they submitted to it philosophically. Fix cursed it, no doubt, but Aouda, with her eyes fastened upon her protector, whose coolness amazed her, showed herself worthy of him and bravely weathered the storm. As for Phileas Fogg, it seemed just as if the typhoon were a part of his program. Up to this time, the Tonkadere had always held her course to the north, but towards evening the wind, veering three quarters, bore down from the northwest. The boat, now lying in the trough of the waves, shook and rolled terribly. The sea struck her with fearful violence. At night, the tempest increased in violence. John Bunsby saw the approach of darkness and the rising of the storm with dark misgivings. He thought a while and then asked his crew if it was not time to slacken speed. After consultation, he approached Mr. Fogg and said, I think, Your Honor, that we should do well to make for one of the ports on the coast. I think so, too. Ah, said the pilot, but which one? I know of but one, returned Mr. Fogg tranquilly, and that is Shanghai. The pilot at first did not seem to comprehend. He could scarcely realize so much determination and tenacity. Then he cried, Well, yes, your honor is right to Shanghai. So the Tonkadere kept steadily on her northward, uh, northward track. The night was really terrible. It would be a miracle if the craft did not founder. Twice it would have been all over her, uh, with her if the crew had not been constantly on the watch. Aouda was in, uh, exhausted but did not utter a complaint. More than once Mr. Fogg rushed to protect her from the violence of the waves. Oh, I'm glad to hear it, Corral. I know that was uh, getting tricky for you.
day appeared. The tempest still raged with undiminished fury, but the wind now returned to the southeast. It was a favorable change, and the Tancadere again bounded forward on this mountainous sea. Through the waves crossed each other, uh, though the waves crossed each other and imparted shocks and countershocks, which would have crushed a craft less solidly built. From time to time the coast was visible through the broken mist, but no vessel was in sight. The Tancadere was alone upon the sea. There were some signs of a calm at noon, but these became more distant as the sun descended towards the horizon. The tempest had been as brief as terrific. The passengers, thoroughly exhausted, could now eat a little and take some repose. The night was comparatively quiet. Some of the sails were again hoisted, and the speed of the boat was very good. The next morning at dawn, they espied the coast, and John Bunsby was able to assert that they were not one hundred miles from Shanghai. A hundred miles, and only one day to traverse them. That very evening, Mr. Fogg was due at Shanghai, if he did not wish to miss the steamer to Yokohama. Had there been no storm, during which several hours were lost, they would be at this moment within thirty miles of their destination. The wind grew decidedly calmer, and happily the sea fell with it. All sails were now hoisted, and at noon the Tancadere was within forty-five miles of Shanghai. There remained yet six hours in which to accomplish that distance. All on board feared that it would, could not be done, and every one, Phileas Fogg no doubt excepted, felt his heart beat with impatience. The boat must keep on an average of nine miles an hour, and the wind was becoming calmer every moment. It was a capricious breeze, coming from the coast, and after it passed, the sea became smooth. Still, the Tancadere was so light, and her fine sails caught the fickle zephyrs so well, that with the aid of the current, John Bunsby found himself at six o'clock not more than ten miles from the mouth of Shanghai River. Shanghai itself is suited at least twelve miles up to the uh, up the stream. At seven they were still three miles from Shanghai. The pilot swore an angry oath. The reward of two hundred pounds was evidently on the point of escaping him. He looked at Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was perfectly tranquil, and yet his whole fortune was at this moment at stake. At this moment also, a long black funnel crowded with wreaths of smoke, appeared on the edge of the waters. It was the American steamer leaving for Yokohama at the appointed time. Confound her! cried John Bunsby, pushing back the rudder with a desperate jerk. Signal her, said Phileas Fogg quietly. A small brass cannon stood on the forward deck of the Tancadere for making signals in the fog. It was loaded to the muzzle, but just as the pilot was about to apply a red-hot coal to the touch hole, Mr. Fogg said, Hoist your flag. The flag was run up at half-mast, and, this being the signal of distress, it was hoped that the American steamer, perceiving it, would change her course a little so as to succor the pilot boat. Fire, said Mr. Fogg, and the booming of the little, little cannon resounded in the air. How are you feeling, by the way, Corral? Just taking a small break between chapters. Well, I'm glad to hear you're alive. Or, I suppose, undead, since you are the vampire. Oh, yeah. I want to show you... Uh... I added that the other night. It took me some uh, tries to get the code right, but 
turned out well, I think. Chapter 22, in which Passepartout finds out that even at the Antip uh, Antipodes, it is convenient to have some money in one's pocket. The Carnatic, setting sail from Hong Kong at half past six on the 7th of November, directed her course at full speed towards Japan. She carried a large cargo and a well-filled cabin of passengers. Um, not for much longer. Um, there was somebody who joined me and asked, um, well, who joined the chat and asked if uh, they could play with me, but I don't think they had Starbound, but they did have Terraria, so we switched over to, to Terraria, and I played a little more, a bit more of that. But I will return to Starbound uh, eventually. Let's see. There we go. The Carnatic, setting sail from Hong Kong at half past six on the 7th of November, directed her course at full steam towards Japan. She carried a large cargo and a well filled cabin of passengers. Two staterooms in the rear were, however, unoccupied, those which had been engaged by Phileas Fogg. The next day, a passenger with a half-stupefied eye, staggered, uh, staggering gait, and disordered hair was seen to emerge from the second cabin and to totter to a seat on the deck. It was Passepartout, and what had happened to him was as follows. Shortly after Fix left him, two waiters had lifted the unconscious Passepartout and had carried him to the bed reserved. Three hours later, pursued even in his dreams by a fixed idea, the poor fellow awoke and struggled against the stupefying influence. The thought of duty unfulfilled shook off his uh, torpor, and he hurried from the, abode of, uh, from the abode, staggering and holding himself up by keeping against the walls, falling down and creeping up again, and irresistibly impelled by a kind of instinct, he kept crying out, The Carnatic! The Carnatic! The steamer lay puffing alongside the quay on the point of starting. Passepartout had been but few steps, uh, had but a few steps to go, and rushing upon the plank he crossed it and fell unconscious on the deck just as the Carnatic was moving off. Several sailors, who were evidently accustomed to this sort of scene, carried the poor Frenchman down into the second cabin, and Passepartout did not wake until they were 150 miles away from China. Thus he found himself the next morning on the deck of the Carnatic, and eagerly in, uh, inhaling the exhilarating sea breeze. The pure air sobered him. He began to collect his senses, which he found a difficult task, but at last he recalled the events of the evening before, Fix's revelation in the opium house. It is evident, he said to himself, that I have been abominably drunk. What will Mr. Fogg say? I, at least I have not missed the steamer, which is the most important thing. Then, as Fix, occurred, uh, as Fix occurred to him, as for the rascal, I hope we were well rid of him, and that he has not dared, as he proposed, to follow us on board the Carnatic. A detective on the track of Mr. Fogg, accused of robbing the Bank of England? Cha! Mr. Fogg is no more a robber than I am a murderer. Should he divulge uh, Fix's real errand to his master? Would it do to tell the part the detective was playing? Would it not be better to wait until Mr. Fogg reached London again, and then impart to him that an agent of the Metropolitan Police had been following him round the world, and have a good laugh over it? No doubt, at least, it was worth considering. The first thing to do was to find Mr. Fogg and apologize for his singular behavior. Passepartout got up and proceeded, as well as he could, with the rolling of the steamer, to the after-deck. He saw no one who resembled either his master or Aouda. Good, he muttered. Aouda has not got up yet, and Mr. Fogg has probably found some partners at whist. He descended to the saloon. Mr. Fogg was not there. Passepartout had only, however, to ask the purser the number of his master's stateroom. The purser replied that he did not know any passengers by the name of Fogg. "'I beg your pardon,' said Passepartout persistently. "'He's a tall gentleman, quiet and not very talkative, and has 
with him a young lady. There is no young lady on board, interrupted the purser. There is a list of the passengers. You may see for yourself. Vaspartu scanned the list, but his master's name was not upon it. All at once an idea struck him. Ah, uh, am I on the Carnatic? Yes, on the way to Yokohama. Certainly. Passepartout had for an instant feared that he was on the wrong boat, but though he was really on the Carnatic, his master was not there. He fell thunderstruck on a seat. He saw it all now. He remembered that the time of sailing had been changed, that he should have informed his master of that fact, and that he had not done so. It was his fault, then, that Mr. Fogg and Aouda had missed the steamer. Yes, but it was still more the fault of the traitor who, in order to separate him from his master and detain the latter at Hong Kong, had inveiled him into getting drunk. And he now saw the detective's trick, and at this moment Mr. Fogg was certainly ruined. His bet was lost, and he himself perhaps arrested and imprisoned. At this thought, Passepartout tore his hair. Ah, if Fix ever came within his reach, what a settling of accounts there would be. After his first dis uh, depression, Passepartout became calmer and began to study his situation. It was certainly not an enviable one. He found himself on the way to Japan, and what should he do when he got there? His pocket was empty. He had not a solitary shilling, not so much as a penny. His passage had fortunately been paid for in advance, and he had five or six days in which to decide upon this future course. He fell to at meals with an appetite, and ate for Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and himself. He helped himself as generously as if Japan were a desert, uh, a desert which nothing, uh, where nothing to eat was to be looked for. At dawn on the 13th, the Carnatic entered the port of Yokohama. This is an important way station in the Pacific, where all the main sa uh, steamers, sorry, where all the mail steamers and those carrying travelers between North America, China, Japan, and the Oriental Islands put in. It was situated in the Bay of Yeddo, and at but a short distance from that second capital of the Japanese Empire and the residence of the tycoon, the evil emperor, before the Mikado, the spiritual emperor, absorbed his office in his own. <coughs> the Carnatic anchored at the quay near the custom house in the midst of a crowd of ships bearing the flags of all nations. Passepartout went timidly ashore on this so curious territory of the Sons of the Sun, S-O-N-S -S of the S-U-N. He had nothing better to do than, taking chance for his guide, to wander aimlessly through the streets of Yokohama. He found himself at first in a thoroughly European quarter, the houses having low fronts and being adorned with verandas, neither which he caught glimpses of. Uh, neat uh, peristyles. Okay. Oh, beneath which he caught glimpses of neat peristyles. This quarter occupied, with its streets, squares, docks, and warehouses, all the space between the prim, uh, promontory of the treaty and the river. Here, as at, Yo uh, at Hong Kong and Calcutta, were mixed crowds of all races, Americans and English, Chinamen and Dutchmen, mostly merchants ready to buy or sell anything. The Frenchman felt himself as much alone among them as if he had dropped down in the midst of the Hottentots. He had at, la at least one resource, to call on the French and English consuls at Yokohama for assistance, but he shrank from telling the story of his adventures, intimately connected as it was with that of his master, and before doing so he determined to exhaust all other means of aid. As chance did not favor him in the European quarter, he perp uh, penetrated that, inhabit uh, that inhabited by the native Japanese, determined, if necessary, to put on to Yedo. The Japanese quarter of Yokohama is called the Benton, after the goddess of the sea, who is worshipped on the islands round about. 
The Paspartu beheld beautiful fir and cedar groves, sacred gates of a singular architecture, bridges half hidden in the midst of the bamboos and reeds, temples shaded by immense cedar trees, holy retreats where there sheltered Buddhist priests and sec uh, sectaries of Confucius, and interminable uh, yeah, interminable streets, where a perfect harvest of rose-tinted and red-cheeked children, who looked as if they had been cut out of Japanese screens, and who were playing in the midst of short-legged poodles and yellowish cats, might have been gathered. The streets were crowded with people. Priests were pressing in procession, uh, were passing in procession, beating their dreary tambourines. Police and custom house officers with pointed hats encrusted with lac and carrying two sabers hung to their waists. Soldiers clad in blue cotton with white stripes and bearing guns. The Mikado's guard, enveloped in silken doublets, hauberks, and coats of mail. And numbers of military folk of all ranks, for the military profession is as much respected in Japan as it is despised in China went hither and thither in groups and pairs. Passepartout saw, too, begging friars, long-robed pilgrims, and simple civilians, with their warped and jet-black hair, big heads, long busts, slender legs, short stature and complexions, varying from copper color to a dead white, but never yellow like the Chinese, from whom the Ch uh, Japanese widely differ. He did not fail to observe the curious equipages, carriages and palanquins, barrows supplied with sails, and, oh, I guess that's barrows, supplied with sails, and litters made of bamboo, nor the women, whom he thought not especially handsome, who took little steps with their little feet, whereupon they wore canvas shoes, straw sandals, and clogs of worked wood, and who displayed tight-looking eyes flat chests, teeth fashionably blackened, and gowns crossed with silken scarves, tied in an enormous knot behind. An ornament which the modern Persian ladies seem to have borrowed from the dames of Japan. Passepartout wandered for several hours in the midst of this motley crowd, looking in at the windows of the rich and curious shops. The jewelry establish establishments glittered with quaint ja uh, Japanese ornaments, the restaurants decked with streamers and banners, the tea houses where the odorous uh, beverage was being drunk with, with sake, a liquor concocted from the fermentation of rice. They spelled it incorrectly. They spelled it S-A-K-I instead of S-A-K-E and the comfortable smoking houses, where they were puffing not opium, which is almost unknown in Japan, but a very fine, stingy tobacco. He went on till he found himself in the fields, in the midst of vast rice plantations. There he saw dazzling camellias expanding themselves, with flowers which were giving forth their last colors and perfumes, not on bushes, but on trees and within bamboo enclosures, cherry, plum, and apple trees, which the Japanese cultivate rather from uh, for their blossoms than their fruit, and which, queerly fashioned, uh, grinning scarecrows protected from the sparrows, pigeons, ravens, and other voracious birds. On the branches of the cedars were perched large eagles. Amid the foliage of the weeping willows were herons, solemnly standing on one leg, and on every hand were crows, ducks, hawks, wild birds, and a multitude of cranes, which the Japanese consider sacred, and which to their minds symbolize long life and prosperity. As he was strolling along, Passepartout espied some violets among the shrubs. Good, he said, I'll have some supper but on smelling them, he found that they were odorless. No chance there, thought he. The worthy fellow had certainly taken good care to eat as hearty a breakfast as possible before leaving the Carnatic, but as he had been walking about all day, the demands of hunger were becoming import, uh, importu, importunate. Okay. 
He observed that the butcher's stalls contained neither mutton, goat, nor pork, and knowing also that it is a sacrilege to kill cattle, which are preserved solely for farming, he made up his mind that meat was far from plentiful in Yokohama. Nor was he mistaken, and in default of butcher's meat, he could have wished for a quarter of wild boar or deer, a partridge or some quails, some game or fish, which, with rice, the Japanese eat almost exclusively. But he found it necessary to keep up a stout heart and to, be po uh, and to postpone the meal he craved till the following morning. Night came, and Passepartout re-entered the narrative uh, native quarter, where he wandered through the streets till by vari-colored lanterns, looking on at the dancers who were executing skillful steps and boundings, and the astrologers who stood in the open air with their telescopes. Then he came to the harbor, which was lit, by, uh, lit up by the rosen torches of the fishermen who were fishing from their boats. The streets at last became quiet, and the patrol, the officers of which, in their splendid costumes and surrounded by their suits, Passepartout thought seemed like ambassadors, succeeded the bustling crowd. Each time a company passed, Passepartout chuckled and said to himself, Good, another Japanese embassy departing for Europe. Good to see that Passepartout made it on a boat. Chapter 23, in which Passepartout's nose becomes out Outrageously long. The next morning, poor, jaded, famished Passepartout said to himself that he must get something to eat at all hazards, and the sooner he did so, the better. He might indeed sell his watch, but he would have starved first. Now or never he must use the strong, if not melodious, voice which nature had bestowed upon him. He knew several J uh, French and English songs, and resolved to try them upon the Japanese, who must be lovers of music, since they were for ever pounding on their cymbals, tam-tams, and tambourines, and could not but appreciate European talent. It was, perhaps, rather early in the morning to get up a concert, and the audience, prematurely aroused from their slumbers, might not possibly pay their entertainer with coin bearing the Mikado's features. Passepartout, therefore, decided to wait several hours, and as he was sauntering along, it occurred to him that he would seem rather too well-dressed for a wandering artist. The idea struck him to change his garments for clothes more in harmony with his project, by which he might also get a little money to satisfy the immediate cravings of hunger. The resolution taken, it remained to carry it out. It was only after a long search that Passepartout discovered a native dealer in old clothes, to which he applied for an exchange. The man liked the European costume, and ere long, Passepartout issued from his shop accoutred in an old Japanese coat and a sort of one-sided turban, faded with long use. A few small pieces of silver, moreover, jingled in his pocket. Good, thought he, I will imagine I am at the carnival. His first care, after being thus Japaneseed, that is in quotations, by the way, was to enter a tea house of modest appearance and upon a half a bird and a little rice to breakfast like a man of, for whom dinner was as yet a problem to be solved. Now, thought he, when he had eaten heartily, I mustn't lose my head. I can't sell this costume again for one still more Japanese. I must consider how to leave this country of the sun, of which I shall not retain the most delightful of memories as quickly as possible. It occurred to him to visit the steamers which were about to leave for America. He would himself offer as a cook or servant in payment of his passage and meals. Once at San Francisco, he would find some means of going on. The difficulty was how to traverse the 4,700 miles of the Pacific which lay between Japan and the New World. Passepartout was not the man to let an idea go begging and directed his steps towards the docks. But as he approached them, this project, which at first had seemed so simple, 
began to grow more and more formidable to his mind. What need would they have of a cook or servant on an American steamer, and what confidence would they put in him dressed as he was? What references could he give? As he was reflecting on this, why, uh, this wise, his eyes fell upon an imp uh, immense placard which a sort of clown was carrying through the streets. The placard, which was in English, read as follows. Acrobatic Japanese Troop, Honorable William Batulkar, Proprietor. Last representations, prior to their departure for the United States, of the long noses, long noses, under the direct patronin, uh, patronage of the god Tingu. Great attraction. The United States, said Passepartout, that's just what I want. He followed the clown and soon found himself once more in the Japanese quarter. A quarter of an hour later, he stopped before a long cabin adorned with several clusters of steamers, the exterior walls of which were de uh, designed to represent in violent colors and without pers uh, perspective a company of jugglers. This was the Honorable William Bat uh, Batulkar, yeah, Batulkar's establishment. That gentleman was a sort of Barnum, the director of a troop of mountebanks, jugglers, clowns, acrobats, equilibrists, uh, yeah, equilibrists and gymnasts, who, according to the placard, was giving his last performances before leaving the Empire of the Sun for the States of the Union. Passepartout entered and asked for Mr. Battlecar, who straightway appeared in person. "'What do you want?' said he to Passepartout, whom he at first took for a native. "'Would you like a servant, sir?' asked Passepartout. "'A servant?' cried Battlecar, caressing the thin, uh, thick grey beard which hung from his chin. "'I already have two who are obedient and faithful, have never left me, and served me for their nourishment.' And here they are, added he, holding out his two robust arms, furrowed with veins as large as the strings of a bass viola. So I can be of no use to you? None. The devil! I should so like to cross the Pacific with you. Ah, said the Honorable Mr. Battlecar, you are no more a Japanese than I am a monkey. Why are you dressed up in that way? A man dresses as he can. That's true. Right. You are a Frenchman, aren't you? Yes, a Parisian of Paris. Then you ought to know how to make grimaces. Why, replied Passepartout, a little vexed that his nation, uh, nationality should cause this question. We Frenchmen know how to make grimaces, it is true, but not any better than the Americans do. Well, not true. Well, if I can't take you as a servant, I can as a clown. You see, my friend, in France they exhibit foreign clowns, and in foreign parts, French clowns. Ah, you're pretty strong, eh? Especially after a good meal. And you can sing? Yes, returned Passepartout, who had formerly been wont to sing in the streets. But can you sing standing on your head with a top spinning on your left foot, and a saber balanced on your right. Hm, I think so, replied Passepartout, recalling the exercises of his younger days. Well, that's enough, said the Honorable William Battlecar. The engagement was concluded there and then. Passepartout had at last found something to do. He was engaged to act in the celebrated Japanese troupe. It was not a very dignified position, but within a week he would be on his way to San Francisco. The performance so noisily announced by the Honorable Mr. Battlecar was to commence at three o'clock, and soon the deafening instruments of Japanese orchestra resounded at the door. Passepartout, though he had not been able to study or rehearse a part, was designated to lend the aid of his sturdy shoulders in the great exhibition of the human pyramid, executed by the long noses of the god Tangu. This great attraction was to close the performance. Before three o'clock the large shed was invaded by the spectators, comprising Europeans and natives.
Chinese and Japanese, men, women, and children, who precipitated themselves upon the narrow benches and into the boxes opposite the stage. The musicians took up a position inside and were vigorously performing on their gongs, tam-tams, flutes, bones, uh, bones, tambourines, and immense drums. The performance was much like all the acrobatic displays, but it must be confessed that the Japanese are the first equilibrist in the world. One, with a fan and some bits of paper, performed the graceful trick of the butterflies and the flowers. Another traced in the air with the odorous smoke of his pipe a series of blue words which composed a, com a compliment to the audience, while the third juggled with some lighted candles, which he extinguished successively as they passed his lips, and relit again without interrupting for an instant his juggling. Another reproduced the most singular combinations with a spinning top in his hands, the revolving tops... Uh, Hang on. Another reproduced the most singular combinations with a spinning top. In his hands, the resolving tops, uh, revolving tops seemed to be animated with a life of their own in their interminable whirling. They ran over pipe stems, the edges of sabers, wires, and even hairs stretched across the stage. They turned round on the edges of large glasses, crossed bamboo ladders, dispensed into all the corners, and produced strange musical effects by the combination of their various pitches of tone. The jugglers tossed them in the air, threw them like shuttlecocks with wooden battle doors, and yet they kept on spinning. They, they put them into their pockets and took them out, still whirling as before. It is useless to describe the astonishing performance of the acrobats and gymnasts, the turning on ladders, poles, balls, barrels, etc., and uh, was executed with wonderful precision. But the principal attraction was the exhibition of the long noses, a show to which Europe is as yet a stranger. The long noses form a peculiar company under the direct patronage of the god Tingu. Attired after the fashion of the Middle Ages, they bore upon their shoulders a splendid pair of wings, but what especially distinguished them was the long noses which were fastened to their faces, and the uses which they made of them. Their noses were made of bamboo, and were five, six, and even ten feet long, some straight, others curved, some ribboned, and some having imitation warts upon them. It was upon these appendages, fixed tightly to their real noses, that they performed their gymnastic exercises. A dozen of these sec uh, sectaries of Tingu lay flat upon their backs, while others, dressed to represent lightning rods, hang on, skip the page. I don't know why it's difficult to turn. Uh, while others, dressed to represent lightning rods, came and frolicked on their noses, jumping from one to the other, and performing the most skillful leapings and somersaults. As a last scene, a human pyramid had been announced, in which fifty long noses were to represent the car of Juggernaut. But, instead of forming a pyramid by mounting each other's shoulders, the artists were to group themselves on top of the noses. It happened that the performer who had hitherto formed the base of the car had quitted the troop, and, as to fill his part, only strength and adroitness were necessary. Passepartout had been chosen to take his place. The poor fellow really felt sad when melancholy reminiscence of his mooth, uh, mooth, youth, <laughs> that was an interesting mess up. He donned his costume, adorned with varicolored wings and fastened to his natural feature, a false nose six feet long. But he cheered up when he thought that this nose was winning him something to eat. He went upon the stage and took his place beneath the rest who were to compose the base of the car of Juggernaut. They all stretched themselves on the floor, their noses pointing to the ceiling. 
A second group of artists disposed themselves on these long appendages, then a third above these, then a fourth, until a human monument reached to the very cornices of the theater soon arose on top of the noses. This elicited, uh, elicited loud applause, in the midst of which the orchestra was just striking up a, de a deafening air. When the pyramid tottered and balance was lost, one of the lower noses vanished from the pyramid, and the human monument was shattered like a castle built of cards. It was Passepartout's fault. Abandoning his position, clearing the floodlights without the aid of his wings, and clambering up to the right-hand gallery, he fell at the feet of one of the spectators, crying, "'I am my master! My master! You here? Myself! Very well, then let's, let us go to the steamer, young man.' Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout passed through the lobby of the theatre to the outside, where they encountered the Honourable Mr. Battlecar, furious with rage. He demanded damages for the breakage of the pyramid, and Phileas Fogg appeased him by giving him a handful of banknotes. At half-past six, the very hour of departure, Mr. Fogg and Aouda, followed by Passepartout, who was in his hurry, had retained his wings and nose six feet long, stepped upon the American steamer. I wonder if it was, um, or why the American steamer hadn't yet left, but it had. Maybe we'll find out in this next chapter. Chapter 24, during which Mr. Fogg and party crossed the Pacific Ocean. What happened when the pilot boat came in sight of Shanghai will be easily guessed. The signals made by the Tankadere had been seen by the captain of the Yokohama steamer, who, espying the flag at half-mast, had directed his course towards the little craft. Phileas Fogg, after paying the stipulated price of his passage to John Bunsby, and rewarding that worthy with the additional sum of five hundred and fifty pounds, <coughs> ascended the steamer with Aouda and Fix, and they stared at one, uh, started at once for Nagasaki and Yokohama. They reached their destination on the morning of the 14th of November. Phileas Fogg lost no time in going on board the Carnatic, where he learned to Aouda's great delight, and perhaps to his own, though he betrayed no emotion, that Passepartout, a Frenchman, had really arrived on her the day before. The San Francisco steamer was announced to leave that very evening, and it became necessary to find Passepartout, if possible, without delay. Mr. Fogg applied in vain to the French and the English consuls, and, after wandering through the streets a long time, began to despair of finding his missing servant. Chance, or perhaps a kind of uh, presentiment, at last led him into the Honorable Mr. Batocar's theatre. He certainly would not have recognized Passepartout in the eccentric Montebank's costume, but the latter, lying on his back, perceived his master in the gallery. He could not help starting, which so changed the position of his nose as to bring the pyramid pell-mell upon the stage. All this Passepartout learned from Aouda, who recounted to him what had taken place on the voyage from Hong Kong to Shanghai on the Tonkadere, in company with one Mr. Fix. Passepartout did not change countenance on hearing the name. He thought that the time had not yet arrived to divulge to his master what had taken place between the detective and himself, and in the account he gave of his absence he simply excused himself for having been overtaken by drunkenness. Uh, in, uh, <laughs> at a tavern in Hong Kong. Mr. Fogg heard his narrative coldly, without a word, and then furnished his man with funds necessary to obtain clothing more in harmony with his position. Within an hour, the Frenchman had cut off his nose and parted with his wings, and retained nothing about him which recalled the uh, sectary of the god Tangu. The steamer, which was about to depart from Yokohama to San Francisco, belonged to the Pacific Mail Steamship Company and was named the General Grant. 
She was a large paddle wheel steamer of 2,500 tons, well equipped and very fast. The massive walking beam rose and fell upon, uh, above the deck. At one end, a piston rod worked up and down, and at the other was a connecting rod, which, in changing the uh, rectilinear motion to a circular one, was directly connected with the shaft of the paddles. The General Grant was rigged with, one, uh, with three masts, giving a large capacity for sails, and thus materially aiding the steam power. By making 12 miles an hour, she would cross the ocean in 21 days. Phileas Fogg was therefore justified in hoping that he would reach San Francisco by the 2nd of December, New York by the 11th, and London on the 20th thus gaining several hours on the fatal date of the 21st of December. There was a full complement of passengers on board, among them English, many Americans, a large number of coolies in, uh, on their way to California, and several East Indian officers who were spending their vacation in making the tour of the world. Nothing of moment happened on the voyage. The steamer, sustained on its large paddles, rolled but little, and the Pacific almost justified its name. Mr. Fogg was as calm and taciturn as ever. His young companion felt himself, uh, herself more and more attached to him by other ties than gratitude. His silent but generous nature impressed her more than she thought, and it was almost unconsciously that she yielded to emotions which did not seem to have the least effect upon her protector. Aouda took the keenest interest in his plans, and became impatient at any incident which, likely, uh, which seemed likely to retard his journey. She often chatted with Passepartout, who did not fail to perceive the state of the lady's heart, and, being the most faithful of domestics, he never exhausted his eulogies of Phileas Fogg's honesty, generosity, and devotion. He took pains to calm Aouda's doubts of a successful termination of the journey, telling her that the most difficult part of it had passed, and now they were beyond the fantastic countries of Japan and China, and were fairly on their way to civilized places again. A railway train from San Francisco to New York, and a transatlantic steamer from New York to Liverpool would doubtless bring them to the end of this impossible journey round the world within the period agreed upon. On the ninth day after leaving Yokohama, Phileas Fogg had traversed exactly one half of the terrestrial globe. The General Grass, uh, Grant passed on the 23rd of November, and 180th mid uh, meridian, and was at the very antipodes of London. Mr. Fogg had, it is true, exhausted 52 of the 80 days in which he was to complete the tour, and there were only 28 left. But, though he was only halfway by the difference of meridians, he had really gone over two-thirds of the whole journey, for he had not obliged to make long circuits from London to Aden, from Aden to Bombay, from Calcutta to Singapore, and from Singapore to Yokohama. Could he have followed without deviation, the fiftieth parallel, which is that of London, the whole distance would only have been about twelve thousand miles, whereas he would be forced, by the irregular methods of locomotion, to traverse twenty-six thousand, of which he had, on the twenty-third of November, accomplished se uh, seventeen thousand five hundred. And now the course was a straight one, and Fix was no longer there to put obstacles in their way. It happened also, on the 23rd of November, that Passepartout made a joyful discovery. It will be remembered that the obstinate fellow had insisted on keeping his famous family watch at London time, and on regarding that of the countries he had passed through as quite false and unreliable. Now on this day, though he had not changed the hands, he found that his watch exactly agreed with the ship's chronometers. His triumph was hilarious. He would have liked to know what Fix would say if he were about. The rogue told me a lot of stories, repeated Passepartout, about the meridians, the sun, and the moon. <laughs> moon, indeed. Moonshine, more likely. If one listened to that sort of people, a pretty sort of time one would keep. 
I was sure that the sun would some day regulate itself by my watch. Passepartout was ignorant that if the face of the watch had been divided into 24 hours, like the Italian clocks, he would have no reason for exultation, for the hands of his clock would then, instead of as now indicating nine o'clock in the morning, indicated nine o'clock in the evening, that is the 21st hour after midnight, precisely the difference between London time and that of the 180th uh, meridian. <clears throat> But if Fix had been able to explain this purely physical effect, Passepartout would not have admitted even if he had comprehended it. Moreover, if the detective had been on board at that moment, Passepartout would have joined issue uh, with him on a quite different subject and in an entirely different manner. I remember when I uh, was in Italy and they had the 24-hour clock on our... Um, bus that we took. I was with uh, the choir on a choir tour there and I remember seeing it turn midnight because it went from uh, 2359 to 0000, zero, zero, zero and it was like the coolest thing for me. It was absolutely zero o'clock. Very quickly taking a sip. I don't remember, John. Have you been to Italy? I know you traveled a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun to see those. Okay, and so I will continue. Where was Fix at that moment? He was actually on board the General Grant. On reaching Yokohama, the detective, leaving Mr. Fogg, whom he expected to meet again during the day, had repaired at once to the English consulate, where he had at last found the warrant of arrest. It had followed him from Bombay and had come by the Carnatic, on which steamer he himself was supposed to be. Fix's disappointment may be imagined when he reflected that the warrant was now useless. Mr. Fogg had left English ground, and it was now necessary to procure this, uh, his extradition. Well, thought Fack, uh, Fix after a moment of anger, my warrant is not good here, but it will be in England. The rogue evidently intends to return to his own country, thinking he has thrown the police off his track. <laughs> good. I will... Follow him across the Atlantic. As for the money, heaven grant there may be some left. But the fellow is already spent in traveling, rewards, trials, bails, elephants, and all sorts of charges, more than five thousand pounds. Yet, after all, the bank is rich. His course decided on, he went on board the General Grant, and was there when Mr. Fogon and Aouda arrived. To his utter amazement, he recognized Passepartout despite his theatrical disguise. He quickly concealed himself in his cabin to avoid an awkward explanation and hoped, thanks to the number of passengers, to remain unperceived by Mr. Fogg's servant. On that, that very day, however, he met Passepartout face to face on the forward deck. The latter, without a word, made a rush for him, grasped him by the throat, and, much to the amusement of a group of Americans, who immediately began to bet on him, administered to the detective a gr perfect volley of blows, which proved the great superiority of French over English uh, pugilistic skills. When Passepartout had finished, he found himself relieved and comforted, Fix got up in a somewhat rumpled condition, and, looking at his adversary, coldly said, Have you done? For this time? Yes. Then let me have a word with you, but I, in your master's interest. Passepartout seemed to be vanquished by Fix's coolness, for he quietly followed him, and they sat down aside from the rest of the passengers. You have given me a thrashing, said Fix. Good, I expected it. Now, listen to me. Up to this time I have been Mr. Fogg's adversary. I am now in his game. Aha! cried Passepartout. 
You are convinced he is an honest man? No, replied Fix coldly. I think I'm a rascal. Shh, don't, bud, uh, don't budge and let me speak. As long as Mr. Fogg was on English ground, it was for my interest to detain him there until my warrant of arrest arrived. I did everything I could to keep him back. I sent the Bombay priests after him. I got you intoxicated at Hong Kong. I separated you from him, and I made him miss the Yokohama steamer. Passepartout listened with closed fists. Now, resumed Fix, Mr. Fogg seems to be going back to England. Well, I will follow him there, but hereafter I will do as much to keep obstacles out of his way as I have done up to this time to put them in his path. I've changed my game, and you see, and simply because it was for my interest to change it. Your interest is the same as mine, for it is only in England that you will ascertain whether you are in the service of a criminal or an honest man. Passepartout listened very attentively to Fix, and was convinced that he spoke with entire good faith. Are we friends? said the detective. Friends? No, replied Passepartout, but allies, perhaps. The least sign of treason, however, I'll twist your neck for you. Agreed, said the detective quietly. Eleven days later, on the 3rd of December, the General Grant entered the Bay of Golden Gate and reached San Francisco. Mr. Fogg had neither gained nor lost a single day. Chapter 25, in which a slight glimpse is had of San Francisco. It was seven in the morning when Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout set foot upon the American continent, if this name can be given to the floating quay upon which they disembarked. These quays, rising and falling with the tide, thus facilitate the loading and unloading of vessels. Alongside them were clippers of all sizes, steamers of all nationalities, and the steamboats, which several decks rise, uh, with several decks rising one above the other, which ply on the Sacra uh, on to Sacramento and its tributaries. There were also heaps. Uh, there were also heaped up the products of a commerce which extends to Mexico, Chile, Peru, Brazil, Europe, Asia, and all the Pacific Islands. Passepartout, in his joy on reaching at last the American continent, thought he would manifest it by executing a perilous vault in fine style, but tumbling upon some worm-eaten planks, he fell through them. Put out of countenance by the manner in which he thus set foot upon the new world, he uttered a loud cry which so frightened the innumerable cor uh, cormorants and pelicans that they that are always perched upon these movable quays, that they flew noisily away. Mr. Fogg, on reaching shore, proceeded to find out at what hour the first train left for New York, and learned that this was at six o'clock p.m. He had, therefore, an entire day to spend in Californian capital, uh, spend in the Californian capital, taking a carriage at a charge of three dollars he and Aouda entered it, while Passepartout mounted the box beside the driver, and they set out for the International Hotel. From this exalted position, Passepartout observed the much curio uh, with much curiosity the wide streets, the low, evenly ranged houses, the Anglo-Saxon Gothic churches, the great docks, the palatial wooden and brick warehouses, the numerous conveyances, omnibuses, horse cars, and upon the sidewalks, not only Americans and Europeans, but Chinese and Indians. Passepartout was surprised at all he saw. San Francisco was no longer the legendary city of 1849, a city of banditti, assassins and incendiaries who had flocked hither in crowds in pursuit of plunder, a paradise of outlaws where they gambled with gold dust, a revolver in one hand and a bowie knife in the other. It was now a great commercial emporium. 
The lofty tower of its city hall overlooked the whole panorama of the streets and avenues, which cut each other at right angles, and in the midst of which appeared pleasant, verdant squares, while beyond appeared the Chinese quarter, seemingly Im uh, imported from the Celestial Empire in a toy box. Sombreros and red shirts and plumed Indians were rarely to be seen, but there were silk hats and black coats everywhere worn by a multitude of nervously active, gentlemanly-looking men. Some of the streets, especially Montgomery Street, which is to San Francisco what Regent Street is to London, the Boulevard des Italiens to Paris, and Broadway to New York, were lined with splendid and spacious stores, which exposed in their windows the products of the entire world. When Passepartout reached the International Hotel, it did not seem to him as if he had left England at all. The ground floor of the hotel was occupied by a large bar of sort, uh, a sort of restaurant freely open to all passers-by who might partake of dried beef, oyster stoup, biscuits and cheese without taking out their purses. Payment was made only for the ale, porter, or sherry which was drunk. This seemed very American to Passepartout. The hotel refreshment rooms were comfortable, and Mr. Fogg and Aouda, installing themselves at a table, were abundantly served on diminutive plates. Uh, after breakfast, Mr. Fogg, accompanied by Aouda, started for the, the English consulate to have his passport visaed. As he was going out, he met Passepartout, who asked him if it would not be well, before taking the train, to purchase some dozens of Enfield rifles and Colt's, revol uh, Colt's revolvers. He had been listening to stories of attacks upon the train by the Sioux and Pawnees. Mr. Fogg thought it a useless precaution, but told him to do as he thought best, and went on to the consulate. He had not proceeded two hundred steps, however, when, by the greatest chance in the world, he met Fix. The detective seemed wholly taken by surprise. What? Had Mr. Fogg and himself crossed the Pacific together and not met on the steamer? At least Fix felt honored to uh, behold once more the gentleman to whom he owed so much, and as his business recalled him to Europe, he should be delighted to continue the journey in such pleasant company. Mr. Fogg replied that the honor would be his, and the detective, who was determined not to lose sight of him, begged permission to accompany them in their walk about San Francisco, a request which Mr. Fogg readily granted. They soon found themselves in Montgomery Street, where a great crowd was collected, the sidewalks, street, horse-car, rails, the doors, uh, shop doors, the windows of the houses, and even the roofs were full of people. Men were going about carrying large posters and flags and ste uh, streamers were floating in the wind, while loud cries were heard on every hand. Hurrah for Camerfield! Hurrah for Mandy Boy! It was a political meeting, at least so Fix conjectured, who said to Mr. Fogg, Perhaps we had better not mingle with the crowd. There must be danger in it. <coughs> yes, replied Mr. Fogg, and blows, even if they are political, are still blows. Fix smiled at his remark, and in order to be able to see without being jostled about, the party took up a position on the top of the flight of steps, situated at the upper end of Montgomery Street. Opposite them, on the other side of the street, between a coal wharf and a petroleum warehouse, a large platform had been erected in the open air towards which the current of the crowd seemed to be directed. For what purpose was this meeting? What was the occasion of this excited assemblage? Phileas Fogg could not imagine. Was it to nominate some high official, a governor or a member of Congress? It was not improbable, so agitated was the multitude before them. Just at this moment there was an unusual stir in the human mass. All the hands were raised in the air, some tightly closed, appeared to disappear suddenly in the midst of the cries, an energetic way, no doubt, of casting a vote. The crowd swayed back, the banners and flags wavered, disappeared an instant, then reappeared in tatters. 
The undulations of the human surge reached the steps, while all the heads floundered on the surface like a sea agitated by a squall. Many of the black hats disappeared, and the great part of the crowd seemed to have diminished in height. It is evidently a meeting, said Fix, and its object must be an exciting one. I should not wonder if it were about the Alabama, despite the fact that the, that question is settled. Perhaps, replied Mr. Fogg simply. At least there are two champions in presence of each other, the Honorable Mr. Camerfield and the Honorable Mr. Mandyboy. Oda leaned upon Mr. Fogg's arm, observed the tumultuous scene with surprise, while Fix asked a man near him what the cause of it all was. Before the man could reply, a fresh agitation arose. Hurrahs and excited shouts were heard. The staffs of the banners began to be used as offensive weapons, and fists flew about in every direction. Thumps were exchanged from the tops of the carriages and the omnibuses, which had been blocked up in the crowd. Boots and shoes went whirling through the air, and Mr. Fogg thought he even heard the crack of revolvers mingling in the din. The rout approached the stairway and flowed over the lower step. One of the parties had evidently been repulsed, but the mere lookers-on could not tell whether Mandyboy or Camerfield had gained the upper hand. It would be prudent for us to retire, said Mr. Uh, said Fix, who was anxious that Mr. Fogg should not perceive, uh, receive any injury, at least until they got back to London. If there is any question about England and all this, and we are recognized, I fear it would go hard with us. An English subject, began Mr. Fogg. He did not finish his sub uh, sentence, for a terrific hubbub now arose on the terrace behind the flight of steps where they stood, and they were, f and there were frantic shouts of, Hurrah for Mandy Boy! Hip, hip, hurrah! It was a band of voters coming to the rescue of their allies and taking the Camerfield forces in flank. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Fix found themselves between two fires. It was too late to escape. The torrent of men, armed with loaded canes and sticks, was irresistible. Phileas Fogg and Fix were roughly hustled in their attempts to protect their fair companion. The former, as cool as ever, tried to defend himself with the weapons which nature had placed at the end of every Englishman's arm, but in vain. A big brawny fellow with red beard, flushed face, and broad shoulders, who seemed to be the chief of the band, raised his clenched fist to strike Mr. Fogg, whom he would have given a crushing blow, had not Fix rushed in and received it in his stead. An enormous bruise immediately made its appearance under the detective's silky hat, which was completely smashed in. Yankee! exclaimed Mr. Fogg, darting a contemptuous look at the ruffian. Englishman, returned the other, we will meet again. When you please. What is your name? Phileas Fogg and yours. Colonel Stamp Proctor. The human tide now swept by after re overturning Fix, who steadily got upon his feet again, though the, with tattered clothes. Happily, he was not seriously hurt. His traveling overcoat was divided into two unique parts, and his trousers resembled those of certain Indians which fit less compactly than, uh, than they are easy to put on. Aouda had escaped unharmed, and Fix alone bore marks of the fray in these black and blue bruises. Thanks, said Mr. Fogg to the detective as soon as they were out of the crowd. No thanks are necessary, replied Fix, but let us go. Where? To the tailor's. Such a vis uh, visit was indeed opportune. The clothing of both Mr. Fogg and Fix was in rags, as if they had themselves been actively engaged in the contest between Camerfield and Mandyboy. An hour later they were once more suitably attired, and with Aodo returned to the International Hotel. Passepartout was waiting for his master, armed with half a dozen six-barreled revolvers. When he received Fix, he knit his brows, but Aouda, having in a few words told him of their adventure, his countenance resumed its placid expression. Fix evidently was no longer an enemy, but an ally. 
He was faithfully keeping his word. Dinner over, the coach would, uh, which was to convey the passengers and their luggage to the station drew up to the door. As he was getting in, Mr. Fogg said to Fix, You have not seen this Colonel Proctor again? No. I will come back to America to find him, said Phileas Fogg calmly. It would not be right for an Englishman to permit himself to be treated in that way without retaliating. The detective smiled but did not reply. It was clear that Mr. Fogg was one of those Englishmen who, while they do not tolerate dueling at home, fight abroad when their honor is attacked. At a quarter before six the travelers reached the station and found the train ready to depart. As he was about to enter it, Mr. Fogg called a porter and said to him, "'My friend, was there not some trouble today in San Francisco?' "'It was a political meeting, sir,' replied the porter. "'But I thought there was a great deal of disturbance in the streets. "'It was only a meeting assembled for an election. "'The election of a general-in-chief, no doubt,' asked Mr. Fogg. "'No, sir, of a justice of the peace.' "'Phileas Fogg got into the train, which started off at full speed.' <laughs> I love that little uh, tongue-in-cheek comment. A violent battle over the election of a justice of the peace. Chapter 26, in which Phileas Fogg and party travel by the Pacific Railroad. From ocean to ocean, so says the Americans, and these four words compose the general designation of the great trunk line which crosses the entire width of the United States. The Pacific Railroad is, however, nearly uh, really divided into two distinct lines, the Central Pacific between San Francisco and Ogden, and the Union Pacific between Ogden and Omaha. Five main lines connect Omaha with New York. New York and San Francisco are thus united by an uninterrupted metal ribbon which measures no less than 3,786 miles. Between Omaha and the Pacific, the railway crosses a territory which is still infested by Indians and wild beasts and a large tract which the Mormons, after they were driven from Illinois in 1845, began to colonize. The journey from New York to San Francisco consumed, formerly, under the most favorable conditions, at least six months. It is now accompanied in seven days. It was in 1862 that, in spite of the southern members of the Congress who wished a more southerly route, it was decided to lay the road between 41st and 42nd parallels. President Lincoln himself fixed the end of the line at Omaha in Nebraska. The work was at once commenced and pursued with true American energy, nor did the rapidity of which it went on injuriously affect its good execution. The road grew on the prairies a mile and a half a day. A locomotive running on the rails laid down the evening before brought the rails to be laid on the morrow, and advanced upon them as fast as they were put in position. The Pacific Railroad is joined by seven branches in Iowa, Kansas, Colorado, and Oregon. On leaving Omaha, it passes along the left bank the Platte River as far as the junction of its northern branch, follows its southern branch, crosses the Laramie Territory and the Wasatch Mountains, turns the Great Salt Lake and reaches Salt Lake City, the Mormon capital, plunges into the Tuila Valley, across the American Desert, Cedar and Humboldt Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, and descends via San, uh, Sacramento to the Pacific. It's grand even on uh, its grade, even on the Rocky Mountains, never exceeding 112 feet to the mile. Such was the road to be traversed in seven days which would enable Phileas Fogg, at least, so he hoped, to take the Atlantic steamer at New York on the 11th of, for Liverpool. The car which he occupied was a sort of long omnibus on eight wheels and with no compartments in the interior. It was applied with two rows of seats perpendicular to the direction of the train on either side of an aisle which conducted to the front and rear platforms. 
These platforms were found throughout the train, and the passengers were able to pass from one end to the, uh, of the train to the other. It was applied with saloon cars, balcony cars, restaurants, and smoking cars. Theater cars alone were wanting, and they will have these some day. Books and news dealers, sellers of edibles, drinkables, and cigars, who seemed to have plenty of customers, were continually circulating in the aisles. The train left Oakland Station at six o'clock. It was already night, cold and cheerless, the heavens being overcast with clouds, which seemed to threaten snow. The train did not proceed rapidly, counting the stoppages. It did not run more than twenty miles an hour, which was a sufficient speed, however, to enable it to reach Omaha within its designated time. There was but little conversation in the car, and soon many of the passengers were overcome with sleep. Passepartout found himself beside the detective, but he did not talk to him. After recent events, their relations with each other had grown somewhat cold. There could no longer be mutual sympathy of, uh, or intimacy between them. Fix's manner had not changed, but Passepartout was very reserved and ready to strangle his former friend in the slightest provocation. Snow began to fall an hour after they started, a fine snow, however, which happily could not obstruct the train. Nothing could be seen from the windows but a vast white sheet against which the smoke of the locomotive had a grayish aspect. At eight o'clock a steward entered the car and announced that the time for going to bed had arrived, and in a few minutes the car was transformed into a dormitory. The backs of the seats were thrown back, bedsteads carefully packed were rolled up by an ingenious system, berths were suddenly improvised, and each traveler had soon at its dispo uh, disposition a comfortable bed protected from curious eyes by thick curtains. The sheets were clean and the pillows soft. It only remained to go to bed and sleep, which everyone did, while the train sped on across the state of California. I find it funny that uh, they have it snowing in the Central Valley in November, early, early November, no less. We don't get snow until like February here, and we're, um, I mean, we're not in the Central Valley, we're in the foothills, but yeah. But then again, you know, things have warmed up over the years. The country between San Francisco and Sacramento is not very hilly. The Central Pacific, taking San Francisco for its starting point, extends eastward to meet the road from Omaha. The line from San Francisco to Sacramento runs in a northeasterly direction along the American River, which empties into San Pablo Bay. The 120 miles between these cities were accomplished in six hours, and towards midnight, while fast asleep, the travelers passed through Sacramento, so that they saw nothing of the important place. The seat of the state government, with its fine quays, its broad streets, its noble hotels, squares, and churches. The train, on leaving Sacramento had, and passing the junction, Rockland. Wow, that's an interesting spelling of Rockland. R O C L I N. There's a K missing. Auburn and Colfax entered the range of the Sierra Nevada. Cisco was reached at seven in the morning and an hour after the dormitory was transformed into an ordinary car and the travelers could observe the picturesque beauties of the mountain region through which they were ste uh, steaming. The railway track wound in and out among the passes, now approaching the mountain sides, now suspending over precipices, avoiding abrupt angles by broad curves, plunging into narrow def uh, defiles, which seemed to have no outlet. The locomotive, its great funnel emitting a weird light with its sharp bell and its cow catcher extended like a spur, mingling, uh, mingled its shrieks and bellows with the noise of torrents and cascades, and twined its smoke among the branches of the gigantic pines. There were few or no bridges or tunnels on the route. The railway turned around the side of the mountains and did not attempt to violate nature by taking the shortest cut from one point to another. The train entered the state of Nevada through the Carson Valley about nine o'clock 
going always northeasterly, and midday reached Reno, where they were. Uh, there was a delay of twenty minutes for breakfast. From this point, the road, running along Humboldt River, passed northward for several miles by its banks. Then it turned eastward and kept by the river until it reached the Humboldt Range, nearly at the extreme eastern limit of Nevada. Having breakfasted, Mr. Fogg and his companions resumed their places in the car and observed the varied landscape which unfolded itself as they passed along. The vast prairies, the mountains lining the horizon, and the creeks with their frothy, foaming streams. Sometimes a great herd of buffaloes massing together in the distance seemed like a movable dam. These innumerable multitudes of uh, ruminating beasts often form an insurmountable obstacle to the passage of the trains. Thousands of them have been seen passing over the trap for hours together in com uh, compact ranks. The locomotive is then forced to stop and wait till the road is once more clear. This happened indeed to the train in which Mr. Fogg was traveling. About twelve o'clock, a troop of ten or twelve thousand head of buffaloes encumbered the track. The locomotive, slackening its speed, tried to clear the way with its cow-catcher, but the mass of animals was too great. The buffaloes marched along with a tranquil gait, uttering now and then deafening bellows. There was no use of interrupting them, for, having taken a, a particular direction, nothing can moderate and change their course. It is a torrent of living flesh which no dam could contain. The travelers dazed on this curious spectacle from the platforms, but Phileas Fogg, who had the most reason of all to be in a hurry, remained in his seat and waited philosophically until it should please the buffalo to get out of the way. Passepartout was furious at the delay they occasioned, and longed to discharge his arsenal of, of revolvers upon them. "'What a country!' cried he. "'Mere cattle stop the trains!' and go by in uh, procession just as if they were not impeding travel. Pablo, I should like to know if Mr. Fogg foresaw this happening in his program. And here's an engineer who doesn't dare to run the locomotive into this herd of beasts. The engineer did not try to overcome the obstacle, and he was wise. He would have crushed the first buffaloes, no doubt, with a catch -catch, uh, cow catcher, but the locomotive, however powerful, should soon have been checked. The train would inevitably have been thrown off the track, and would then have been helpless. The best course was to wait patiently, and regain the lost time by greater speed when the obstacles was, uh, obstacle was removed. The procession of buffaloes lasted three full hours, and it was night before the track was clear. The last ranks of the herd were now passing over the rails, while the first had already disappeared below the southern horizon. It was eight o'clock when the train passed through the defiles of the Humboldt Range, and half past nine when it penetrated Utah, the region of this great salt lake, the singular colony of the Mormons. Chapter 27 In Win in which Puffbartu undergoes at a speed of twenty miles an hour a course of Mormon history. During the night of the 5th of December, the train ran southeasterly for about fifty miles, then rose an equal distance in a northeasterly direction towards the Great Salt Lake. Puffbartu, about nine o'clock, went out upon the platform to take the air. The weather was cold, the heavens gray, but it was not snowing. The sun's disk, enlarged by the mist, seemed an enormous ring of gold, and Passepartout was amusing himself by calculating its value in pounds sterling, when he was diverted from its, this interesting study of a strange-looking personage who made his appearance on the platform. This personage, who had taken the train at Elko, was tall and dark, with black mustaches, black stockings, a black silk hat, a black waistcoat, black trousers, a white cravat, and dogskin gloves. He might have been taken for clergyman. He went from one end of the train to the other, and affixed to the door of each car a notice written in manuscript. 
Passepartout approached and read one of these notices, which stated that Elder William Hitch, Mormon missionary, taking advantage of his presence on train number 48, would deliver a lecture on Mormonism in car number 117 from 11 to 12 o'clock, and that he invited all who were desirous of being instructed concerning the mysteries of the religion of the Latter-day Saints to attend. I'll go, said Passepartout to himself. He knew nothing of Mormonism except the custom of polygamy, which is its foundation. The news quickly spread through the train, which contained about 100 passengers, 30 of whom, at most attracted by the notice, ensconced themselves in car number 117. Passepartout took one of the front seats. Neither Mr. Fogg nor Fix cared to attend. At the appointed hour, Elder William Hitch rose, and in an irritated voice, as if he had already been contradicted, said, I tell you that Joe Smith is a martyr, that his brother Hiram is a martyr, and that the persecutions of the United States government against the prophets will only take a martyr for Brigham Young. Who dares to say the contrary? No one ventured to gainsay the missionary, who excited, uh, whose excited tone contrasted curiously with his naturally calm visage. No doubt his anger rose from the hardships to which the Mormons were actually subject, uh, subjected. The government had just succeeded, with some difficulty, in reducing these independent fanatics to its rule. It had made itself master of Utah and subjected that territory to the laws of the Union, after imprisoning Brigham Young on a charge of rebellion and polygamy. The disciples of the Prophet had been redoubled, uh, had since redoubled their efforts and resisted, by words at least, the authority of Congress, Elder Hitch, as is seen, was trying to make uh, proselytes on the very railway train. I suppose I should. And there we go. Then, emphasizing his words with his loud voice and frequent gestures, he related the history of the Mormons from biblical times, how that, in Israel, a Mormon prophet of the tribe of Joseph published the annals of a new religion and bequeathed them to his son, Moram, who, many centuries later, in translation, a translation of his precious book, which was written in Egyptian, was made by Joseph Smith, Jr., a vermint... Uh, of sorry, Vermont farmer, who revealed himself as a mystical prophet in 1825, and how, in short, the celestial messenger appeared to him in the illuminated forest and gave him the annals of the Lord. Several of the audience, not being much interested in the missionary's narrative, here left the car. But Elder Hitch, continuing his lecture, related how Smith, Jr., and his father, two brothers, and a few disciples, founded the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which adopted not only uh, in America, but in England, Norway, and Sweden, and Germany, counts many artisans, as well as men engaged in the liberal professions. Among its members, how a colony was established in Ohio, a temple erected there at a cost of $200,000, and a town built at Kirkland. How Smith became an enterprising banker and received from a simple mummy showcase uh, showman a papyrus scroll written by Abraham and several famous Egyptians. The elder's story became somewhat wearisome, and his audience grew gradually less until it was reduced to twenty passengers, but this did not disconcert the enthusiasts who proceeded with the story of Joseph Smith's bankruptcy in 1837, and how his ruined creditors gave him a coat of tar and feathers. His reappearance some years afterwards, some honorable and honor- uh, more honorable and honorable than ever, at Independence, Missouri, the um, the chief of a flourishing colony of 3,000 disciples and his pursuit, uh, pursuit thence by outraged Gentiles and retirement into the far west. Ten hearers only were now left, among them honest Passepartout, who was listening with all his ears. Thus he learned that after lo- uh, long persecution, Smith reappear- uh, reappeared in Illinois, and in 1839 founded a community at Nauvoo, 
on the Mississippi, numbering 25,000 souls of which he became mayor, chief justice, and general-in-chief, that he announced himself in 1843 as a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and that finally being drawn into uh, ambuscade at Carthage, he was thrown into prison and assassinated by a band of men disguised in masks. Passepartout was now the only person left in the car, and the elder, looking him full in the face, reminded him that two years after the assassination of Joseph Smith, the inspired prophet Brigham Young, his successor, left Nauvoo for the banks of the Great Salt Lake, where, in the midst of that fertile region, directly on the route of the emigrants who crossed Utah on their way to California. The new colony, thanks to the polygamy practiced by the Mormons, had flourished beyond expectations. And this, added William, uh, Elder William Hitch, is why the jealousy of Congress has been aroused against us. Why have the soldiers of the Union invaded the soil of Utah? Why has Brigham Young, our chief, been imprisoned in contempt of all justice? Shall we yield to force? Never! Driven from Vermont, driven from Illinois, driven from Ohio, driven from Missouri, driven from Utah, we shall yet find some independent territory of which to plant our tents. And you, my brother, continued the elder, fixing his angry eye upon his single auditor, Will you not plant yours there, too, under the shadow of your flag? No, replied Passepartout courageously, in his turn retiring from the car and leaving the elder to preach to vacancy. During the lecture, the train had been making good progress, and towards half-past twelve, it reached the northwest border of the Great Salt Lake. Thus, the passengers could observe the vast extent of its interior sea, which is also called the Dead Sea, and into which flows an American Jordan. It is a picturesque expanse, framed in lofty crags and large strata, encrusted with white salt, a superb sheet of water which was formerly of larger extent than now, its shores having encroached into the lapse of time, and thus at once reduced its breadth and increased its depth. The Salt Lake, 70 miles long and 35 wide, is situated 3 miles 800 feet below the sea. Quite different from Lake uh, Asphaltite, whose depression is 1,200 feet below the sea, it contains considerable salt and one quarter of the weight of its water is solid matter, its specific weight being 1,107. Uh, 1,170, and after being distilled, 1,000. Fishes are, of course, unable to live in it, and those which descend from the, uh, through the Jordan, the Weber, and other streams soon perish. The country around the lake was well cultivated, for the Mormons are mostly farmers, while ranches and pens are domesticated uh, for domesticated animals, fields of wheat, corn, and other cereals, luxuriant prairies, hedges of wild rose, clumps of acacia and milkwort would have soon seen six months later. Now the ground was covered with a thin powdering of snow. The train reached Ogden at two o'clock, where it rested for six hours. Mr. Fogg and his party had time to pay a visit to Salt Lake City, connecting with Ogden by a branch road, and they spent two hours in this strikingly American town, built on the pattern of other cities of the Union, like a checkerboard, with the somber sadness of right angles, as Victor Hugo expressed it. The founder of the City of the Saints could not escape from the taste of symmetry, which distinguishes Anglo-Saxons. In this strange country, where the people are certainly not up to level of their institutions, everything is done squarely, cities, homes, and follies. The travelers, then, were pre uh, promenading at, six, uh, uh, sorry, at three o'clock about the streets of the town built between the banks of the Jordan and the spurs of the Wasatch Range. They saw few or no churches, but the prophet's mansion, the courthouse, 
and the arsenal, blue brick houses with verandas and porches, surrounded by gardens, bordered with acacia, palms, and locusts. A clay and pebble wall, built in 1853, surrounded the town, and in the principal street were the market and several hotels, adorned with pavilions. The place did not seem thickly populated. The streets were almost deserted, except in the vicinity of the temple, which they only reached after having traversed several quarters, surrounded by um, palisades. There were many women, which were, uh, which was easily accounted for by the peculiar institution of the Mormons, but it must not be supposed that all the Mormons were polygamists. They are free to marry or not as they please, but it is worth noting that it is mainly the female citizens of Utah who are anxious to marry, as, according to the Mormon religion, maiden ladies are not admitted to the possessions of its highest joys. These poor creatures seem to be neither well nor off nor happy. Some, the more well-to-do, no doubt, wore short, often black silk dresses under a hood of modest shawl, or uh, others were habited in uh, Indian fashion. Passepartout could not behold without a certain fright these women charged in groups with conferring happiness on a single Mormon. His common sense pitied, above all, the husband. It seemed to him a terrible thing to have to guide so many wives at once across the vicissitudes of life, and to conduct them, as it were, in a body to the Mormon paradise, which, uh, with the prospect of seeing them in the company of the glorious smith, who doubtless was the chief ornament of the delightful place to all eternity. He felt decidedly repelled for such a vocation, and he imagined, perhaps he was mistaken, that the fair ones of Salt Lake City cast rather alarming glances on his person. Happily, his stay there was but brief. At four, the party found themselves again at the station, took their places in the train, and the whistle sounded for starting. Just at the moment, however, that the locomotive wheels began to move, cries of, Stop! Stop! were heard. Trains, like time and tide, stopped for no one. The gentleman who uttered the cries was evidently a belated Mormon. He was breathless with running. Happily for him, the station had neither gates nor barriers. He rushed along the track, jumped on the rear platform of the train, and fell exhausted into one of the seats. Passepartout, who had been anxiously watching this amateur gymnast, approached him with lively interest and le uh, learned that he had taken flight after an unpleasant doc uh, domestic scene. When the Mormon had recovered his breath, Passepartout ventured to ask him politely how many wives he had, for from the manner in which he had decamped, it might be thought that he had at least twenty. One, sir, uh, replied the Mormon, raising his arms heavenward. One, and that was enough. So it looks like we have time for one more chapter, and then we'll um, take a small break and come back for a game stream. Chapter 28, in which Passepartout does not succeed in making anybody listen to reason. The train on leaving Great Salt Lake in, at Ogden passed northward for about an hour as far as Weber River, having completed nearly 900 miles from San Francisco. From this point, it took an easterly direction toward the jagged Wasatch Mountains. It was in the section included between, Wasatch, uh, between this range and the Rocky Mountains that the American engineers found the most formidable difficulties in laying the road, and that the government granted a subsidy of 48 thousand dollars per mile instead of sixteen thousand allowed for the work done on the plains. But the engineers, instead of violating nature, avoided its difficulty by winding round instead of penetrating the rocks. One tunnel only, fourteen thousand feet in length, was pierced in order to arrive at the Great Basin. The track up to this time had reached its highest elevation at the Great Salt Lake. From this point, it described a long curve descending towards Bitter Creek Valley to rise again to the dividing ridge of the waters between the Atlantic and the Pacific. 
There were many creeks in this mountainous region, and it was necessary to cross Muddy Creek, Green Creek, and others upon curvlets, uh, culverts, curvlets. Passepartout grew more and more impatient as they went on, while Fix longed to get out of this difficult region, and was more anxious than Phileas Fogg himself to be beyond the dangers of delays and accidents and set foot on English soil. At ten o'clock at night the train stopped at Fort Bridger Station, and twenty miles later entered Wyoming Territory, following the Valley of Bitter Creek thought, uh, throughout. The next day, December 7th, they stopped for a quarter of an hour at Green River Station. Snow had fallen abundantly during the night, but being mixed with rain, it, was, uh, it had half melted and did not interrupt their progress. The bad weather, however, annoyed Passepartout, for the accumulation of snow by blocking the wheels of the car could certainly have been fatal to Mr. Fogg's tour. What on idea, he said to himself. Why did my master t make this journey in winter? Couldn't he have waited for the good season to increase his chances? While the worthy fresh, uh, Frenchman was absorbed in the state of the sky and the depression of the temper uh, uh, temperature, Aouda was experiencing fears from a totally different cause. Several passengers had got off at Green River and were walking up and down the platforms, and among these Aouda recognized Colonel Stamp Proctor, the same who had so grossly insulted Phileas Fogg at the San Francisco meeting. Not wishing to be recognized, the young woman drew back from the window, feeling much alarmed at her discovery. She was attached to the man who, however coldly, gave her daily evidences of the most absolute devotion. She did not comprehend, perhaps, the depths of the sentiment with which her protector inspired her, which she called gratitude, but which, though she was not conscious of it, was really more than that. Her heart sank within her when she realized the man whom Mr. Fogg desired, sooner or later, to call to account for his conduct. Chance alone, it was clear, had brought Colonel Proctor on this train, but there he was, and it was necessary at all hazards that Phileas Fogg should not perceive his adversary. Aouda seized a moment when Mr. Fogg was asleep to tell Fix and Passepartout whom she had seen. "'That Proctor on this train?' cried Fix. "'Well, reassure yourself, madam. Before he settles with Mr. Fogg, he has got to deal with me. It seems to me that I was the more insulted of the two. And besides, added Passepartout, I'll take charge of him, Colonel, as he is. Mr. Fix, resumed Aouda, Mr. Fogg will not allow, uh, will allow no one to avenge him. He said that he would come back to America to find this man. Should he perceive Colonel Proctor, he could not prevent a collision which might have, uh, we could not prevent a collision which might have terrible results. He must not see him. You are right, madam replied Fix. A meeting between them might ruin all. Whether we were victorious or beaten, Mr. Fogg would be delayed, and, and, called Passepartout, that would play the game of the gentlemen of the Reform Club. In four days we shall be in New York. Well, if my master does not leave this car during these four days, I may hope that chance will not bring him face to face with this confounded American. We must, if possible, prevent his stirring out of it. The conversation dropped. Mr. Fogg had just woke up and was looking out of the window. Soon after Passepartout, without being heard by his master or Aouda, whispered to the detective, Would you really fight for him? I would do anything, replied Fix in a tone which betrayed determined will, to get him back living to Europe. Passepartout felt something like a shudder shoot through his frame, but his confidence in his master remained unbroken. Was there any means of detaining Mr. Fogg in the car to avoid a meeting between him and the colonel? It ought not to be a difficult task, since that gentleman was naturally sedentary and little curious. The detective, at least, seemed to have found a way, for, after a few moments, he said to Mr. Fogg, "'These are long and slow hours, sir, that we are passing on the railway.' Yes, replied Mr. Fogg, but they pass. You were in the habit of playing whist, resumed Fix, on the steamers. 
Yes, but it would be difficult to do so here. I have neither cards nor partners. Oh, well, we can easily buy some cards, for they are sold on all the American trains. And as for partners, if Madame plays, certainly, sir. I would have quickly replied, I understand whist. It is part of an English education. I myself have some pretensions to playing a good game. Well, here are three of us and a dummy. As you please, sir, replied Mr. Fogg, heartily glad to resume his favorite pastime, even on the railway. Passepartout was dispatched in search of the steward, and soon returned with two packs of cards, some pins, counters, and a shelf covered with cloth. The game commenced. Aouda understood whist su uh, sufficiently well, and even received some compliments on her playing from Mr. Fogg. As for the detective, he was simply an adept, the worthy of being matched against his present opponent. Now, thought Passepartout, we've got him. He won't budge. At eleven in the morning, the train had reached the dividing ridge of the waters at Bridger Pass, seven thousand five hundred and twenty-four feet above the level of the sea, one of the highest points attained by the track in crossing the Rocky Mountains. After going about two hundred miles, the travelers at last found themselves on one of their, uh, those vast plains which extended to the Atlantic, and which nature had made so uh, propitious for laying the road, uh, the iron road. On the declivity of the Atlantic Basin, the first streams branched from the North Platte River appeared uh, already appeared. The whole northern and eastern horizon was bounded by the immense semicircular curtain which is formed by the southern portion of the Rocky Mountains, the highest being Laramie Peak. Between this and the railway extended vast plains, plentifully uh, irrigated. On the right rose the lower spurs of the mountainous mass which extends southward to the sources of the Arkansas River, one of the great tributaries of the Missouri. At half past twelve the travelers caught sight for an instant of Fort Halleck, which commands that section, and in a few more hours that rocky mountains were crossed. There was reason to hope then that no accident would mark the journey through this difficult country. The snow had ceased falling, and the air became crisp and cold. Large birds, frightened by the locomotive, rose and flew off in the distance. No wild beasts appeared on the plain. It was a desert in its vast nakedness. After a comfortable breakfast served in the car, Mr. Fogg and his partners had been resumed, had just resumed whist when a violent whistling was heard, and the train stopped. Passepartout put his head out of the door, and but saw nothing to cause the delay. No station was in view. Aouda and Fix feared that Mr. Fogg might take it into his head to get out, but that gentleman contented himself with saying to his servant, "'See what is the matter.' Passepartout rushed out of the car. Thirty or forty passengers had already descended, amongst them Colonel Stamp Proctor. The train had stopped before the red signal which blocked the way. The engineer and con uh, conductor were talking excitedly with the signalman, whom the station master at Medicine Bow, the next stopping place, had sent on before. The passengers drew around and took part in the discussion, in which Colonel Proctor, with his insolent manner, was conspicuous. Passepartout joined the group, heard the signalman say, No, you can't pass. The bridge at Medicine Bow, uh, Bow is shaky and would not bear the weight of the train. This was a suspension bridge thrown over some rapids about a mile from the place where they, were, uh, where they now were. According to the signalman, it was in a ruinous condition, several of the iron wires being broken, and it was impossible to risk the passage. He did not in any way exaggerate the condition of the bridge. It may be taken for granted that, rash as the Americans usually are, when they are prudent, there is good reason for it. Passepartout, not daring to apprise his master of what he heard, listened with set teeth, immovable as a statue. Hm, cried Colonel Proctor. We are not going to stay here, I imagine, and take root in the snow. 
Colonel, replied the conductor, we have telegraphed to Omaha for a train, but it is not likely that it will reach Medicine Bow, um, Bow, in less than six hours. I don't know why I struggle with that name. Six hours, cried Passepartout. Certainly, returned the conductor. Besides, it will take as long as that to reach Medicine Bow on foot. It is only a mile from here, said one of the passengers. Yes, but it's on the other side of the river. And can't we cross that in a boat? asked the colonel. That's impossible. The creek is swelled by the rains. It is the rapid, and we shall have to make a circuit of ten miles to find uh, to the north to find a ford. The colonel launched a volley of oaths, denouncing the railway company and the conductor, and Passepartout, who was furious, was not disinclined to make a uh, common cause with him. Here was an obstacle, indeed, which all his master's banknotes could not remove. There was a general disappointment among the passengers who, without reckoning the delay, saw themselves compelled to trudge fifteen miles over a plain covered with snow. They grumbled and protested, and would certainly have thus attracted Phileas Fogg's attention if he had not been completely absorbed in his game. Passepartout found that he could not avoid telling his master what had occurred, and with hanging head he was turning towards the car when the empire, uh, engineer, a true Yankee named Forster, called out, Gentlemen, perhaps there is a way after all to get over the bridge. On the bridge? asked the passenger on the bridge. With our train? With our train. Passepartout stopped short and eagerly listened to the engineer. But the bridge is unsafe, urged the conductor. No matter, replied Forster. I think that by putting on the very highest speed we might have a chance of getting over. The devil, muttered Passepartout. But a number of the passengers were at once attracted by the engineer's proposal, and Colonel Proctor was especially delighted and found the plan a very feasible one. He told stories about engineers leaping their trains over rivers without uh, bridges by putting on full steam and many of these, uh, many of those present avowed themselves of the engineer's mind. We have fifty chances out of a hundred of getting over, said one. Eighty! Ninety! Passepartout was astounded, and though ready to attempt anything to get over Medicine Creek, thought the experiment proposed a little too American. Besides, thought he, there's still a more simple way, and it does not even occur to any of these people. Sir, said he aloud to one of the passengers, the engineer's plan seems to me a little dangerous, but eighty chances, replied the passenger, turning his back on him. I know it, said Passepartout, turning to a um, another passenger, but a simple idea, ideas are no use, returned the American, shrugging his shoulders, as the engineer assures us that we can pass. Doubtless, urged Passepartout, we can pass, but perhaps it would be more prudent. What? Prudent, cried Colonel Proctor, whom his words seemed, to, uh, this word to, seemed to excite prodigiously. At full speed, don't you see it? Full speed! I know, I see, repeated Passepartout, but it would be, if not more prudent, since that word displeases you, at least more natural. Who? What? What's the matter with this fellow? cried several. The poor fellow did not know to whom to address himself. Are you afraid? asked Colonel Proctor. Afraid? I afraid? Very well, I will show these people that a Frenchman can be as American as they. All aboard! cried the conductor. Yes, all aboard, repeated Passepartout, and immediately. But they can't prevent me from thinking that it would be more natural for us to cross the bridge on foot and let the train come after. But no one heard his sage reflection, nor would any one have acknowledged its, ju uh, its justice. The passengers resumed their places in the cars. Passepartout took his seat without telling what had passed. The whist players were quite absorbed in their game. The locomotive whistled vigorously. The engineer, reversing the steam, backed the train for nearly a mile, retiring like a jumper in order to make uh, take a longer leap. Then, with another whistle, he began to move forward. The train increased its speed, and soon its rapidity became frightful. 
A prolonged screech issued from the locomotive. The piston worked up and down twenty strokes to the second. They perceived that the whole train rushed on at the rate of a hundred miles an hour, hardly bore, over, uh, bore upon the rails at all. And they passed over. It was like a flash. No one saw the bridge. The train leaped, so to speak, from one bank to the other, and the engineer could not stop it until it had gone five miles beyond the station. But scarcely had the train passed the river when the bridge, completely ruined, fell with a crash into the rapids of Medicine Bow. All right, so we have reached the end of our story time today. Um, I'm really quickly going to see if Mr. Multi is on, because I have been promising him a Deponia um, stream. So let me quickly message him. Uh, but regardless if he is on or not, I will be coming back with a game stream. It's just to be seen which game I will be playing. So I'm going to take a quick break. I will um, post in chat when the stream is back so you can refresh the fa uh, page if it doesn't already uh, refresh. So I will see you in a little bit.